Minister has seen it, right? Yeah. yeah. So no. we haven't, like I said, we haven't got those numbers yet. The reporting has started, so we hope we get those numbers on a regular basis. So yeah. can it be reported <coughs> to the local health unit, too? Maybe they are. Maybe they are. Ready? Okay, everyone, we're about to get started. Um, 30 minutes, one question, one follow-up, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Williams and Dr. Yaffe for brief remarks. Good afternoon, and Monday, of course, the 6th of April, and this is the, uh, after the weekend, our first uh, full week, I call it the, the post, um, uh, the wind down of the travel uh, impacts and that aspect there. We're going to hear some numbers today and see how we're doing. As I said, this week's an important one as we uh, ease out of the uh, period of time when we had a lot of people returning uh, to Ontario, and I'll talk about that in a moment and how it's going to go. And then another uh, aspect is later in the week, how well are our public health measures, our physical distancing doing? And I've been uh, pleased when I've run around watching and stuff that people are doing that, they're adhering to that. Uh, we hear anecdotes that some people still are being casual, but I hear there was less issues over the weekend. And of course, some municipalities, such as Toronto, has taken steps to uh, limit that. And um, they did so. I heard examples of where they had undertaken to um, tell people that those uh, parks and areas were not open as people wanted to take part in the warmer weather on the weekend. So uh, first, let's go over to the uh, numbers for today, over to uh, Dr. Yaffe. I'll let you cover those numbers, Dr. Yaffe. Okay, thank you. So as of uh, yesterday at 4 p.m., the numbers have, that have been input by the local health units into the Integrated Public Health Information System, we have a total of 4,347 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Ontario, which represents an increase of 309 from the previous day. About 35% of the cases are in people 60 years of age and older, and 52% of the cases are in people who live in the greater Toronto area. Of all the cases, about 20% had traveled in the 14 days prior to becoming ill. 13% had a close contact with a case. 19% had community exposure. And about 48%, the exposure information is still pending. At this point, unfortunately, there are 132 um, cases that have passed away. And we have at, at least 46 outbreaks in long-term care facilities uh, involving 56 deaths, some of which were lab confirmed, others not. We are at about 1,624 resolved cases, which is going up. It's, it's about almost 40% of our cases at this point. We also um, know that at this point we have uh, currently 589 patients with COVID-19 currently in hospital in Ontario. Of those, 216 are in ICU. And of the 216, 160 are on a ventilator. In terms of lab testing, uh, we have, uh, as you know, uh, basically gotten rid of the backlog. We have tested almost 79,000 almost 79, people in Ontario. Uh, currently, 329 are un under investigation. In the last 24 hours, we've processed uh, about 3,500 uh, people's tests. I'll turn it back to Dr. Williams. Right. Well, thank you. And um, a couple of things we're I'm looking at here as we move into this time. Um, you'll notice that some of the data we're utilizing at this time, we talk about cumulative hospitalization, and that's going way back to January. And after a while, that, that total becomes less meaningful, and we're looking at how do we get some more, as we're changing some of the data points, how many currently are in the hospital, how many have been discharged, and all those aspects there. So we continue to watch that as we progress in this uh, uh, phase of the uh, outbreak. And so that's one aspect there. I noticed that um, today, of course, we've dropped down to uh, just over 300, uh, just over 300. And um, that is um, our lowest almost in a week and, and a bit over a week. 
uh, as we had uh, moved up uh, for your memory we were last time we were down below that was back on March 31st and then we climbed up to uh, highs of 426 and 462 and then um, petered around that at the top end of uh, the upper threes and the four and now we're down to 309 so the question is um, <clears throat> how does that uh, relate to our other activities um, there was some peak times I expected to see uh, with our travel drop is that we'd we'd stayed at fairly high numbers up until about two weeks ago from um, basically tomorrow and Wednesday and then it dropped down one step and then by Thursday we dropped down another step so two weeks back from this Thursday so it'll be interesting to see how our numbers uh, progress as the week goes on in that regard. Uh, there and the other aspects is that we continue to work with our uh, federal authorities um, assessing uh, the new information especially related to um, uh, various uh, cases with uh, ideas and concepts around uh, so-called um, transmission or at least positivity in cases of people who are deemed to be asymptomatic they found on some large studies that well people had been found to be uh, in had the presence of the uh, the organism in their PCR and their nasal pharynx during that time when they asked those people more details 75% uh, of those that are asymptomatic actually found they said well I, I guess I was I just didn't think about it and so there's that aspect of is it truly asymptomatic or just so low that people didn't think too much about it and then we have some aspects around uh, pre-symptomatic in periods there where people it has been found but how infectious are they at that time and whether there's a potential to be infectious uh, it was deemed to be less than when they peaked time just before they became symptomatic in the so-called prodrome immediately before and their viremic so it's a long phrase for the when the virus had reached its peak in their body and they were deemed to be much more infectious at that time so we're learning more about this all the time and being informed by that of how we might address our policies and principles in that regard as we continue our uh, social uh, distancing people prefer the physical distancing term and our other measures that we put in place now we have some even further uh, reduction in essential businesses uh, and uh, how is that going to impact us uh, in that regard as people are doing various things to I guess to adjust to that uh, status of how to continue that on the next week or two as we go forward and monitor how well we are doing in our numbers as we progress there furthermore the data that we're uh, continually feeding into our modeling and that was remember last Friday uh, in that and to see how that is impacting those numbers in there and uh, even now just reflecting of where we were at at that time when they reported like last uh, was data based from last Wednesday and Thursday by now we should have been doubled that with over 5,000 cases and we haven't so maybe that is reassuring that we are continuing to bend the curve and to make an impact but we want to make sure we get the right numbers to them so they can revisit and refine their predictions as they said in the press conference based on receiving real-time data and how that informs them accordingly so with that I'm going to open up for questions from uh, people on the line sure we'll take the first question your first question comes from Lisa Zing with CBC please go ahead hi there doctor yeah, sorry about that I forgot to unmute myself um, my first question is about telehealth Ontario uh, at first uh, you've said people should call telehealth to get advice if they have COVID symptoms and earlier today uh, Health Minister Christine Elliott um, suggested that people should actually be calling their family doctors now for faster service so can you clarify what people should be doing at this stage to get answers sure um, when we started off we had uh, telehealth and we were dealing with a large load where the uh, average calls uh, in a day went from the uh, mid uh, uh, f four to uh, seven thousand up to over twenty thousand in a period of time because that was our most available tool at that time to respond to that and then um, as we progressed along we add the self-assessment tool as you recall and that had has over nearly a million and a half hits on that one and it continues to be well utilized uh, following that we did introduce in consultation with the OMA uh, the uh, different fee codes that would allow physicians to do uh, phone call virtual consultations if you may and to handle that as a result a number of them uh, made it available in their practice uh, 
placements, whether it's in a family practice, a health team, different formats, that they would have someone available to take calls and to answer questions and concerns from some of their patients. And, of course, they would be um, even better prepared because they would have often the chart electronically in front of them to be able to converse with that uh, member or the person who was part of their practice and could answer that in a timely fashion. So that was added there, and, and that's why I think the minister was saying um, – during this time as well, call your primary care physician uh, because they're there, they're available, they're ready to receive those calls, and they could to give you advice on more on your own actual per, um, perspective because they actually have access to your chart and uh, di different details that would make it even more, um, I would say, refined than you would get at telehealth. Telehealth is still available, and for people who don't have a primary care physician or are having trouble reaching in some cases, then call health, telehealth. It still has a good place to call for advice and direction. Same as the self-assessment tool, and they, of course, are segueing into the assessment centers, now nearly 100 in the province of Ontario. So there's many ways and venues for those who feel they might have symptoms of COVID or concerned if they have symptoms of COVID or just want to have some further information to understand family members they want to ask about. So there's many sources that you can go to and you should access those when you need them and in the way that you're most comfortable to do so. So it's been an evolving story, a good one in a way, because we've really ramped up all the different ways that our public can approach. And we've seen the numbers in telehealth come down. The self-assessment um, uh, hits come down. I'm not sure yet. We haven't got the metrics on the um, physician calls at this stage, uh, but they have, of course, increased over the time when they come on board. So I think a lot of people are have had a number of their questions answered, and we're, we're hoping that um, they feel it is done in a timely way, in a way that answers their concerns and gives them advice and direction that's appropriate at all times and helps to segue them into further testing and care as necessary. Follow-up? Thanks very much. Uh, my follow-up is about testing in long-term care homes. Uh, in terms of limiting the spread in those homes, uh, have you given more thought? Is there more discussion to more widespread testing? If if we know that asymptomatic people carry the disease, uh, but right now only symptomatic folks are being tested. Uh, so how are these homes supposed to properly isolate um, people who may be transmitting the disease who don't have symptoms? Okay. Dr. Yaffe? Yeah, um, certainly that the long-term care uh, population is a very vulnerable population, um, very high risk if the infection is introduced into the long-term care home. So, of course, the most important thing is to try and prevent it from coming in, uh, which is the importance around uh, uh, not having uh, visitors except in, uh, you know, important uh, compassionate circumstances. Uh, screening everybody coming in, all the staff, uh, twice a day, including the temperature. Screening the residents twice a day, including temperature. Um, but uh, you're you're right. Once we have any suspect, uh, any suspicion of symptoms, um, the first thing is to test that person, isolate them, and test anyone else who's symptomatic. Um, we are ref looking at the testing criteria. Um, and uh, one of the things that's happening right now is, in fact, there's a group of experts looking at uh, now that the testing capacity has gone up, um, we want to expand who's tested, but in a way that's controlled so we don't end up with a backlog. And this is one of the high, prop high pr uh, priority populations and consideration of potentially testing people who are close to the case who are asymptomatic, people around them. Um, people who work, uh, the residents who uh, share a room with them or share dining space or people who worked with them, you know, the staff. So that is certainly one of the areas we're, we're seriously looking at now. Next question. Your next question comes from Allison Jones with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Williams, you touched on this uh, a bit already, but I'm hoping you can expand on it. You mentioned the number of new cases, uh, just over 300. It also says um, on the website that it's about a 7.7% increase over yesterday, which is the lowest percentage I remember seeing in quite a while. Um, can we read anything into that? Or is, is you know a one-day relatively low percentage just too little to read anything into? Well, yes, and we'd like to be optimistic and to see if this is a trend. 
Um, as I was trying to give a sense there, the numbers over the last week, it uh, rose up on the 31st. It stayed and plateaued around the middle of the week, around the mid and, and uh, 400s and upper 300s in there. Um, and we had 408 on Sunday and then 309 uh, today, which are results from yesterday, by the way. So, um, <clears throat> so I'd like to be encouraged, but you're correct. One day is only one day, and there's lab test flow and different things that happen. So I would not be jumping to any conclusions at this stage because, as I said, in, in looking at the amount of travel people back in the two-week period before, uh, we didn't have a, a major drop that would affect it until uh, maybe in the next day or so. But... Um, we want to test that, and of course, we want to continue to monitor how well our um, public health measures are doing and how, like a report card back on ourselves, if we're ma having success, as the modelers had hoped for, to continue bending the curve even more. Follow-up? Yeah, I just wanted to um, confirm. Um, Dr. Yaffe had said that uh, gave a number of 589 patients with COVID-19 currently in hospital. But then, Dr. Williams, you talked about cumulative totals. So I just want to be sure, is 589 the number of people who are right now in hospital with COVID-19, or is that the cumulative total? Uh, according to the data I have, that is the number of people currently in hospital with COVID-19. Now, keeping in mind that people uh, probably will be in hospital for a period of time, so this isn't necessarily people, you know, recently admitted. We don't have uh, at this point yet, but we will, I guess, more of a, you know, a daily number, hopefully. How many are admitted? How many are discharged? Next question. Your next question comes from Rob Ferguson with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi there, doctors. Just uh, my usual question. What's the number right now on healthcare workers that uh, are infected with COVID-19? I have it somewhere. <clears throat> In the back there. I know the last time I had it was around 239. Uh, cumulative again, mm -hmm. um, and even in the data there with the 589 on one chart, it says it's cumulative since January with the hospital patients, and I'm just trying to see if that number has risen above the 239, and I don't have that data piece in front of me, Rob, at the moment. Mm -hmm. It was, yes, the other day it was 239, but I think that has been updated accordingly. So 400, about 451, so that was, my 239 was a week ago. Oh, you found it. Yes, 451. <laughs> it's usually around roughly 10% of the total. And that's cumulative, of course, since January. Yeah. Do you know if any of those are hospitalized or in ICU? What's the status of all those? Oh, I That data we, we don't get. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, I know of ones, different ones that were hospitalized for a while and discharged. Uh, in and out, um, but we don't get that broken down because when you say healthcare workers, that is their profession. Now they may have gotten it um, um, following return from travel and um, been uh, in isolation or at home in there. Uh, we'd like to get some more breakdown or any related to uh, the more concerning side. Did they get it from what we call the word nosocomial or infection in the hospital while on duty? And then we're trying to see if we can segment that data to understand that. Uh, in there as for how many were um, uh, in ICU or ventilation. No, we don't have that data, Rob. Next question. Your next question <coughs> comes from David Haynes with Queen's Park Briefing. Please go ahead. Hi there, doctor. Um, so uh, to uh, focus on uh, the uh, bed capacity, um, uh, um, the modeling that came out on Friday, uh, show that uh, in a best case scenario, uh, the province would be uh, near capacity, uh, but would have enough. Um, but um, it's unlikely that that capacity will be evenly distributed throughout the province. Are there parts of the province that you're looking at as as um, as being at particularly uh, high risk of being over capacity? Um, is that based on uh, them having? Um, higher rates of infection right now or on demographics and so on. 
So I'm going to see if I got all the questions. You're a bit faint there. <clears throat> I think you're talking about hospitalization and the modeling saying that we would be at capacity uh, in certain areas of the province at different times. And I think if I got it correct, and you have to correct me, is that you were saying, and does that depend on the demographics or high-risk populations that the different areas might be dealing with or, or not? Is that, did I get that correct? Uh, yeah, that um, are there particular regions of the province that you are concerned about more than others based on uh, how many positive tests they have right now and the uh, types of demographics for those regions of the province? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> um, what we're finding is that the, um, I mean, most of our cases uh, are in the GTA uh, between uh, the larger um, areas like Toronto and Peel and York, uh, Durham and out around there, which have the most, of course, uh, hospital facilities, uh, isolation rooms and um, ICU beds and ventilators. So uh, in that sense, it is, is they're the ones that are seen quite a few. Uh, some of them have more load than each other, and there may be, there's no need yet, I've heard yet, of uh, shifting and moving in that because not all everybody gets the person admitted at that time. While there's a 6% hospitalization, it doesn't mean it's going to be equally divided. It depends on the individuals and who have the misfortune of having more serious um, uh, sequelae of the infection requiring hospitalization and then unfortunately ICU and ventilation. Uh, I think the more concerning ones out in the areas out further when you may have uh, regional areas that have less um, capacity in that sense and if you get a large hit in population or in cases and uh, with some have very much a number of re retirees and older age groups that may have more risk of uh, more severe consequences. So we try to watch that very carefully, and that's why we have our regional committees of OH set up that uh, looks at that data, looks at the hospital usage, the, uh, what isolation rooms they have, uh, ICUs, vents, and how much they relate to the long-term care facilities and the uh, retirement homes and other facilities they could use to offload all of a sudden sudden surges if it did occur. And of course, if there was extensive, they would have to offload to other regions around, and that's part of the value of the command team, as well as having the regional tables that uh, try to solve it within the region, and then they can go outside to seek. So it's right now everybody is is coping and doing well at that time. The hospital, um, because of the rollback in the elective surgery, uh, some at an all-time low in almost 15 years in that, so um, building up that capacity to deal with the surge if and when it does occur. And we are seeing increased uh, numbers, as Dr. Yaffe has alluded to, and that's not surprising because, as I said in our data, we just went through a week of having numbers up in the, uh, for the first time in the 400s of new cases, and if the hospitalization rate is at the 6% rate and then the ICU rate at the 2 to 3% rate, then we'll see a, a, an appropriate surge in that level as well. Uh, the challenge being is that sometimes those admitted to the ICUs and that don't just stay for a few days. Some, unfortunately, have to be in there for an extended period of time, and that means that the occupancy increases uh, disproportionately, if you may. Follow-up? Um, so uh, when, when you're talking about a shift in capacity from one region to another, because one, one region might be harder hit uh, than uh, the uh, one next door, and so on. Do you have an idea of uh, how quickly that can be turned around? Uh, is that something that uh, resources can be significantly shifted from one place to another uh, in hours or, you know, or in two days, say? Um, well, good questions on scenarios. It depends on some of the facilities. If they have room for more ventilators, they can be moved over there. You have to bring the staffing and some of them with it accordingly to make sure they can move from one facility to another to handle those loads. Um, <clears throat> there's others where you may have, uh, if we're very uh, critical patients or that come on very quickly, you may choose to use Orange and that to move them to a more tertiary care center uh, for that time period as well. So there is that flexibility using your... Um, uh, various uh, services for patient transfers um, is, uh, at Orange, for example, on that if it's really from a, a far distance that needs to be handled. So 
there's many strategies that can be undertaken, and that's why there's no cookie-cutter approach. It depends on the circumstances, and that's why the advantage of having all the players at each of the regional table uh, to put their best minds to the task, and then also then they can merge into the federal or in the whole province-wide command table to see how we would orchestrate and to assist in moving resources accordingly. Next question. <clears throat> Your next question comes from Justin Yorcelli with Yes TV. Please go ahead. Hi, Doctor. How are you? Thank you. Um, I have a question. So, do you think we've reached our peak uh, in Ontario with the, the numbers today? Well, I guess we're all looking for that, aren't we? And we would. I'd like to be able to say that with confidence. I, I said that we peaked earlier in the week uh, in the upper 400s. Uh, we were still doing with lab backlog, new labs coming on board, testing capacity, and as Dr. Yaffe said, we've removed that backlog now, so we're getting much more uh, real time, if you may. Uh, so some of that large amount may have been due to backlog numbers, so we may have been in the more like the low 400s uh, in there. <clears throat> and so as the other uh, reporter had asked about, uh, with this now dropping down to 309, uh, we haven't below, been below 300 in over six or seven, seven days, eight days. A bit early to make that conclusion um, now that we stabilize the testing. Now, the other thing is that as we do more tests, it'll change it again. So we have to make sure we don't um, mix that into it if we do a lot more testing with, uh, as Dr. Yaffe alluded, with uh, our outbreaks in our long-term care facilities. And as our um, lab and surveillance group are looking at other strategies to utilize this capacity to give us even better data, wider data, of which the uh, modelers are asking for. And so we're trying to deal with that and to keep meeting all the different priority groups. So I'm just trying to give, prepare you to say, well, I'm going to get some numbers coming back in the next three or four days. It may be merged in with a new enhanced wider testing, which is good. So we're going to have to be able to segment that and to answer your question on the wider basis, have we have we um, plateaued at least on the um, the travel related issues? Because as Dr. Yaffe had alluded to, the ones that are related to travel, that percentage continues to ease down from it was in the mid 20s down to under 20 percent, heading down to even lower. So uh, in the future, you'd have to say if if the borders have closed and everything, we should have there should be hardly anyone related to travel, uh, but case contacts and others. So we're we're looking at that as well. So. That's a long answer to say, I'd like to think so, but let's stay tuned. Follow-up? My follow-up is, um, what do the numbers have to be for the, you know, the state of emergency to be lifted and for gyms and bars, uh, schools and all that to reopen? Um, that is a, a big part of what I've been trying to look at. Um, actually, when we started in this one, um, I want to be clear on what we do when we ramp up. Our public health uh, measures uh, working group or table, headed by uh, the former uh, medical officer of health for Toronto, Dr. David McEwen, uh, is looking at that issue as well to say uh, in the fact when you see the numbers are improving, because we would like to think about when you can start turning that dial back as we use that um, allegory and <clears throat> we found out in the past that if you just flip it back very fast you often have to re retrace your steps and that would be most disappointing so we want to know that when can we roll back some aspects to help um, people to adjust and to uh, return to some other areas of especially necessary functionality without um, violating totally all of some of our distancing aspects so we're having a group look at that right now and so that if and when that time comes we hope to be able to give some direction to um, uh, to the Minister of Health and to the Premier and Cabinet of when they might want to uh, uh, change and ease as always they're looking for recommendations from myself and from uh, all the ones who would give advice on that regard so we're looking at that very intensely right now Okay, we're going to move on. This is going to be our last caller. Your next question comes from Kenyon Wallace with the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, doctors. Thanks so much for taking my call. Um, I just have a question again about testing numbers, and that is um, we spoke last week about how we have we were going to have expanded capacity now in Ontario, 
And I assume that we do because we've been able to uh, eliminate most of that backlog. So my question is, um, how come we don't have as many, if we have all this capacity, how come we don't have that many tests? How come we're not doing that many tests? Is it that they're just not coming in from hospitals and assessment centers? So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a a group that's uh, been struck of ex experts uh, that's been meeting very intensively over the weekend and now in the in the next day or two to come up with um, priority groups for testing given the increased capacity uh, because we didn't want to just say go ahead and test everybody that you you know with symptoms or without symptoms for that matter because we'd end up with a backlog immediately and back to square one so uh, once we get the strategies uh, approved then we will communicate out to the field and uh, for example we know long-term care is a high priority uh, health care workers and so on but we we know we can expand we just need to uh, come up with the specific groups and how to how to do it and that will be communicated out very quickly but in the meantime I would say uh, the assessment centers are aware that there's increased capacity um, and uh, we are certainly saying, you know, if, if you're concerned about this person, please do test them. Follow-up? Yeah, um, if there's been any kind of um, thought on expanding, I know you mentioned this expert group um, is, is coming up with, with something. Um, do you know if there's been any uh, talk about opening this to, to more like surveillance testing where we test lots of people to get a sense of the uh, diseases uh, prevalence in the general population? Well, we already do sentinel testing um, of people uh, who are seeing a family, you know, a group, sample of family doctors uh, for uh, influenza-like illness. Uh, we get them tested for COVID-19. Uh, and uh, in fact, that's how we picked up uh, some of the outbreaks in long-term care facilities through the Sentinel testing. We also have um, a system called ACES, which looks at the, the uh, trends in COVID, uh, suspect COVID uh, patients coming through emergency departments. Uh, so certainly that's part of what we're doing and, and we, we are always looking at how we can do better on that as well. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thank you.